today we're going to be doing um, plant pathology, which is going to be so interesting. Um, and then at the end, we're going to have some time for Q&A about the projects, because those are coming up soon. And so um, I think the way we'll probably do that is mostly um, kind of one-on-one -on -one Q and A. So as opposed to big group questions, you know, we'll have time where we'll all hang around for that last half hour. And if you have questions, you can ask them. I will also say that if you have a lot of questions, please approach uh, me or Bev or anyone or uh, yeah anyone who's worked on the project and ask us questions at the break too, because I know you guys might have questions. Um, word to the wise: the sun path stuff is can be intimidating. It's fine to describe it with words. If it does not make sense to you how the pictures work, that is a fine, viable way to do it, okay? When people turn in their projects, there will be a combination of like people who did weird, intense trigonometry, <laughs> people who took a bunch of pictures, and people who wrote a paragraph, right? Like you can be any one of those people or something else I haven't even thought of yet. Just convey that you understand it. So. With that, I am going to introduce Matt Jones. Matt is our amazing presenter for today. Um, he will quickly become one of your favorite local agents. He is based out of Chatham County, uh, where he helps run, uh, or he runs the Master Gardener program there, and he's very, very involved at the state level, so he's always kind of someone good to know, because he knows what's going on, and typically knows the hot gossip. So, um, very useful that way. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ashley. Everyone hear me okay? I think the microphone is on. Uh, so the plan today is a uh, somewhat condensed lecture on plant pathology, diseases, and disorders uh, that we'll go through in the first hour or so. And I want to, but I want to spend the majority of the time um, on the hands-on exercises we'll be doing as, as groups, and that will involve um, uh, looking at problems presented as if you were a, uh, or as you will be soon, a master gardener volunteer, uh, but problems presented uh, that might come from clients, and then you have to research. Uh, based on the clues you're given, what that problem is and, and how to resolve it. So in addition to covering the <laughs> basics of plant diseases and disorders, I'll spend a little bit of time on the diagnostic process and on some research methods. So for the first hour, um, hang on, here we go. <laughs> All right, so before we, uh, you, we, we uh, ponder what a diseased plant is like or any diseased organism is important, to uh, understand what healthy looks like. You, don't, you may not uh, uh, instantly recognize what is uh, a, a, a normal situation for a plant. Uh, you're not, uh, with, with, with people I suppose you kind of have a, have a, a good gestalt of what a healthy person looks like, but with plants it can be a, a little trickier, especially if you're unfamiliar with the anatomy, morphology, or, or other structural components of the plant, or if we're working with, or we're dealing with ornamentals that have been bred for certain aesthetic features, which can look quite a bit different. So for example, at the uh, tips of uh, junipers, you, you can see these um, kind of red growths, uh, and similar to, to other uh, others in this group, and you might think is that, is that some disease component. No, that's a reproductive structure. Those are the male cones of uh, a juniper, for example. In other cases, like this uh, Gladitsia, this is a cultivar that its normal state has yellow leaves. Um, normally you would see yellow leaves in, in the growing season anyway and think it might be a uh, symptom of chlorosis or a lack of a nutrient, but that is normal for that cultivar. Similarly, there are many cultivars uh, that have different uh, the degrees of uh, variegation or other unusual features on the leaves that can look unusual. So the start at the baseline needs to be knowing what a healthy version of that plant looks like. In addition to knowing what the plant is, too, it's very helpful uh, if, if, you, if you start with uh, knowing what the, the true identity of that species or even cultivar um, will greatly narrow down the uh, potential diagnostic uh, explanations for that problem. And then there are other things that are uh, look strange but aren't diseases at all. So often you can find lichen uh, growing on uh, tree bark or, or uh, limbs and trunks, etc. This is a a dual or sometimes triple organism of a, a fungus, an algae, uh, or a, a, a cyanobacterial symbiote. But these are quite normal and are there themselves not directly infecting the tree. Sometimes a uh, high concentration of these can be a symptom of or a, an indicator of slow growth 
because uh, normally as trees grow, they will shed bark, and that uh, results in a, a regular rate of, of shedding that um, will prevent these from accumulating to a large degree, but these themselves are not infectious or problematic. And then ferns have unusual growths on the underside of the leaves. These are structures that are involved in dispersing their offspring. These are sporangia that disperse spores that will grow into new fern plants. So these are also perfectly normal. And you're not a, an extension agent until you've gotten the question, why is my birch tree peeling? Or, you know, uh, so, so knowing, knowing that uh, the way, different ways that barks, uh, bark uh, exfoliates among species can be helpful too. And you won't be a master gardener volunteer if you're truly initiated until you get a, a call about this phenomenon. There's a, um, a slime mold that will, is a, one of the many um, uh, groups of organisms that is part of the decomposition process, especially in mulches. And at certain stages of their development, this is their like unicellular state, um, but they will uh, converge and form these masses uh, for reproduction. Um, and so they can appear relatively suddenly and they look gross, but these are perfectly harmless. There's nothing, there's nothing that's going to consume in your entire yard. So um, if those appear, just tell folks to wait, wait it out, it will disappear in a few days, or they can, if they really want to, they can um, dig it up to bother them aesthetically, if they're in one of those kinds of HOAs. But true diseases themselves are in, uh, we categorize them as either abiotic or biotic. Biotic meaning there is a, another organism involved in the process, an infectious organism. Um, more often, uh, uh, problems that are caused by environmental or cultural conditions are referred to as disorders, but not always. But uh, more broadly, think of them as abiotic or biotic. Um, so uh, abiotic can be uh, you know, drought or um, uh, planting in the wrong place or planting in the wrong way, and then uh, different organisms of the lookout can cause different kinds of disease symptoms on different plants. The patterns that these diseases and disorders appear in the landscape also varies among the two types. So uh, an abiotic disorder tends to appear relatively suddenly. So say there's a hailstorm or a lightning strike or a uh, or salt application along a roadside. Well, um, the following, uh, 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 they will uh, induce uh, symptomatic uh, uh, sorry, symptoms that appear relative, seem to be, appear relatively suddenly. Whereas biotic diseases, because it is an infectious organism, it, uh, it is growing on another organism, it takes time for that process to happen. So biotic diseases, diseases caused by other organisms, tend to appear relatively slowly. A abiotic di uh, disorder might affect many species because it's, if it's some environmental or cultural factor, it, those don't tend to discriminate. Uh, whereas uh, biological diseases, biotic diseases, uh, tend, the organisms that cause the diseases tend to have host preferences. So they will only be able to infect certain groups of species and not others. So if you see symptoms on uh, unrelated species nearby, it may be a greater indicator of an abiotic disorder. Uh, biotic diseases tend to appear in more random or hot spot patterns depending on how the, dis the dispersal mechanism um, or unit of that uh, uh, organism occurred. So say if it's spores from a, a fungus that travels on splashing water or on wind, that's going to appear on the plant relatively randomly. But if it's some sort of uh, abiotic disorder, the symptoms appear to be more linear or geometric or more uniformly distributed overall. With biotic diseases, because again, that uh, organism is infecting and growing through and consuming the host plant, you all, often but not always see a transition zone between healthy tissue, newly infected tissue, and tissue that's been completely consumed or is, is uh, done with, essentially. So you might see a, a halo effect or, or a transition of coloration as the organism spreads through the plant tissue. Whereas with abiotic disorders, there's often a more abrupt uh, differentiation between healthy and unhealthy tissue, or affected and uh, not uh, unaffected tissues. Uh, somewhat anecdotally, but some, some based on evidence, a lot of the problems that uh, happen in landscapes are often abiotic. It is, uh, I think we're culturally prone to just assume <laughs> it's a, uh, a disease that randomly affected your, 
your, or your landscape when in fact it's sort of falling. <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, diseases, we, even in human health, we want the pill for every ill, right? So um, most, most clients are prone to want to hear it's a disease and they want to know what to spray on that to make it magically go away. But often um, it is an abiotic issue. So um, the wrong plant for the wrong place, it was planted too deeply or improperly, um, or they pruned it at the wrong time, et cetera. Oh, I got hit my phone. So for example, uh, uh, abiotic issues can be cultural, so again, mostly user error, uh, uh, pruning at the wrong time, planting the wrong place, and planting improperly, uh, doing uh, crimes against uh, humanity like this, <laughs> which is very common. Uh, those are all uh, potential causes of abiotic disorders. So cultural issues. Um, and and do we, we, are we familiar with this term, volcano mulching? So yeah, don't do that. Uh, uh, a trunk is meant to be above ground, not below ground. When you surround it with it, uh, too much mulch, it's, it's effectively below ground. Uh, and then uh, abiotic disorders can also be caused by environmental factors or environmental extremes. So temperature, so freeze damage, chilling injury. This is uh, when injury occurs uh, above freezing, but it's a a plant that is not adapted normally to our area. So say a warm season crop like uh, cucurbits uh, get exposed to temperatures say in 40 degree range, they can uh, ex still exhibit uh, tissue damage because they're not adapted to that. And similarly, uh, extremes of heat can cause uh, uh, symptoms that are problematic, heat scorching, uh, sunburning of fruit. This is not uncommon with peppers, for example. Uh, and often it's associated with uh, some insect feeding uh, pepper fruits uh, often are covered partially by leaves as they're developing because the leaves are always a little bit floppy, you know. But if an insect or some other, or Bambi maybe, comes along and chews a few leaves and suddenly exposes the fruit to full sun, you can get uh, localized tissue injury called a sunburn. Not enough water and too much water can also be uh, potential abiotic disorder, causes of abi abiotic disorders. Uh, in droughts, different species respond to different ways. Um, if you, in botany, you've learned about how transpiration works, where uh, water evaporates out of the leaves, and that is the mechanism by which plants draw water in from the soil. Whenever the stomata are open, uh, they're taking in carbon dioxide, but they're also losing water. So uh, plants uh, have a variable ability to regulate that depending on the environmental conditions. But if, um, uh, if water is, 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 uh, becomes too depleted, they will shut their stomata, they can't undergo photosynthesis, so they'll start to use food reserves too. In other cases, like um, uh, back to birches again, uh, they are a little bit dramatic when it comes to droughts. If they're really uh, drought prone suddenly, they'll just drop all their leaves. They'll freak out and say, I can't lose any more water, so they'll just <laughs> drop, I think it's happened in my head too. Uh, and um, <laughs> this is extension. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, uh, but often when that happens with birches, for example, they will pr produce more leaves uh, later in the season and be okay. So that is just another adaptive mechanism. Uh, then too much water can be problematic uh, for two reasons. One, uh, roots need oxygen, just like we do, just like the rest of the plant does. Uh, if there, is, if water in the soil is filling up all the pore spaces, there is a much lower um, distribution of oxygen uh, in the soil, and so the roots can die for lack of oxygen, they can literally drown, but also too much water will promote or make a, a favorable environment to certain kinds of root pathogens, like root rot. And then uh, lack of or too much nutrients can also cause uh, sim observable symptoms that can be considered abiotic disorder. So a uh, lack of nutrients in the soil might manifest in uh, the appearance of the leaves. Uh, so you might see patterns of chlorosis or yellowing between veins or on the margins of the leaves um, or other color changes associated with nutrient deficiency. Uh, and then also too much fertilizer can cause problems too. If fertilizer is over applied, um, they can take in too many of those uh, salts, so fertilizers and, and, and nutrients are, are chemically salts. And different plants deal with that in different ways. And one way is to try to um, house it temporarily in, in uh, leaves and that will result in um, a scorching appearance on the leaves and leaf drop. In other cases, uh, you can apply, if uh, you're uh, inaccurate, you can apply fertilizers directly on the leaves unintentionally that can cause uh, 
uh, tissue damage as well. And even misapplication or drift from herbicides can cause uh, injuries too. Uh, this is uh, a grape leaf, which is extremely sensitive to uh, herbicide drift from a herbicide called 2,4-D. So this, th uh, certain formulations of this herbicide are uh, vaporize or volatilize really easily. And uh, they, uh, a, a, this sort of symptom may indicate someone used 2,4-D nearby. It's, uh, and then um, misapplication of things like Roundup, if you're trying to get a weed, but you hit the, um, uh, a, a, a non-target plant, and that can manifest in certain ways too. Uh, Dr. Joe Neal is our weed specialist at NC State, and he has a whole uh, portal or part of a portal about herbicide injury symptoms. Uh, I will say though um, that if there is an issue where you and then Ashley suspect that there might have been herbicide misapplication and it wasn't the homeowner's fault, that that leaves the, the realm of an educational agency, which is what we are, and that moves into a regulatory agency. So at that point, the uh, homeowner could contact an NCDA, a Department of Agriculture uh, pesticide inspector and they would handle it from there. So uh, there's no need for you to uh, make judgment calls on that if that is the, if that is the context. Uh, mechanical damage can um, uh, also be problematic. This is another cultural issue, but uh, line trimmer damage is not uncommon. You get certain, um, usually, um, uh, partners uh, that tend to be of a certain sex get a little uh, overconfident when they've they got the line trimmer getting really close to the trunk and they'll end up damaging the outer tissue. And remember uh, that there is a really important tissue in the outer edge of uh, a plant's uh, stem, namely phloem and vascular cambium, that if you damage too much of that, it can't be restored and, and the plant can't move uh, food made in the leaves down to the roots and, and vice versa and food stored in the roots up to the rest of the plant. So one, one way to prevent this um, is to say mulch around trees and discourage errant husbands from getting too close. Sorry. Yes. Okay. So that last phrase you said was about the mulch is too close, because I've always been told by city people and the amount of work helpers, you do not want to do that. Oh, mulch sorry. So this is- up against the tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is not the best and uh, best example of not, you, do, you don't want mulch against the tree. Oh, I see. But, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you don't want to mulch up against the tree, but you can mulch around yes, trees yes. as a way to prevent. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right, yes, a good point, though. Thank you. And then random vaccination can certainly happen. And it's, it, it, um, there can be, there are examples of uh, soybean fields having real weird patterns suddenly overnight, and it wasn't uh, some alien abduction. Um, residue, it was a lightning strike in the middle of the field, hail damage can cause problems too, uh, et, et cetera. Now onto the, uh, path, the uh, biotic diseases. They, uh, different diseases can infect uh, different plants and on a specific uh, group of plants or an individual plant, different diseases will infect different organs of that plant. So you can have diseases of roots, of shoots, uh, of, of leaves, internally, externally, of fruits, of flowers, um, there could be uh, 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 crown galls, which that's a bacterial infection at the base of the plant, uh, et cetera. And um, have you done insects yet? Okay, so remember the difference between a sign and a symptom. A sign is a direct evidence of that pest or disease presence. So you actually see the organism that's doing the infection on the plant. So in the case of pathogens, you would look for the presence of mycelia, so we'll see later most of the body of a fungus is, uh, is the, 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 this collection of strands of cells that are moving through other organisms or through the soil, and then they produce um, fruiting structures that release spores, and in some cases it looks sort of like mushrooms. Uh, but this, this, is the, this is the mycelial body of, um, of, um, of um, our, um, Amillaria root rot. Um, back the bark, if you see a tree in decline and there's no other uh, clear explanation of the problem, no cultural changes, um, you can peel back the bark, especially if it's on decline. If you see these, this white mat of tissue, it's probably armillaria, and in which case the tree is doomed. This is a very good indicator for that, that, uh, that disease. 
Um, and then uh, fungi also produce fruiting bodies, as I said, uh, those are structures that release spores. So the, if you look closely under the, the microscope, the uh, presence of fruiting bodies can be a good indicator. The presence of spores themselves, this is, uh, this is a uh, group of spores here, uh, the Ascomycetes fungus. And then in other cases, as we'll see with bacteria, you can do the slime test, the ooze test, um, because bacteria are going to be in a, in a watery solution um, if, if you have a certain kind of a, a stem, a wilt disease, cut, it, cut open the stem, uh, put it in, in some water uh, and a clear glass, and you can watch the, the streams and streams of bacteria ooze out. So those are signs, so direct evidence of the organism on the infected plant. Symptoms are those uh, 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 visual uh, points that I'm these symptoms are, are, are changes that uh, are, that are um, caused by the disease and are manifest in changes in the plant tissue, like I talked about. So uh, um, a symptom of a pathogen is evidence that there is a disease present, but um, the presence of that disease has caused certain visual changes in those plant tissue areas. And then a pathologist um, crudely, more or less, group the description of these symptoms in a different categories. The handbook has a, a full description of what these uh, refer to, but you, you can see a few here. So a spot is, as you might imagine, kind of a roundish uh, lesion, often on leaves. The spots can have a halo like you see here. So what likely happened is the spore landed at this black spot at uh, the center of this lesion. That's where it first infected the tissue. and. Uh, spreads uh, through a mycelial body, it will often spread in a circular fashion. So this uh, yellow tissue was the next um, uh, uh, point of the leaf to be infected, and then this, this red edge here is where the fungus is actively growing and consuming the leaf tissue. And then you get into this, this healthy tissue here. Here, two different spores or three different spores likely infected the leaf, and are now those leaf and the spots are Stunting can also be an issue in some cases. Uh, that is just uh, slow growth. Um, a rot is just a generalized decay. It's often used in the context of fruit, um, of fruit rots, but also roots. Uh, blight is pretty dramatic. Uh, dieback of mostly stem and leaf tissue, um, often starting from the tip down, but always. A wilt disease is an infection of the interior components of a stem, namely the phloem and xylem of the stem. So uh, a classic example would be um, uh, Fusarium wilt of tomato, where um, uh, you see, despite watering it well, despite not uh, no evidence of root rot, you see that the plant itself is wilting. And it's wilting because it can't take up water because there are uh, either fungi or bacteria growing inside the xylem and the flow. Uh, cankers refer to sort of elliptoid, uh, elliptic lesions, so often sunken. Uh, usually this is uh, used to describe lesions on stem tissue. And then dieback is, as the name implies, you see um, uh, uh, often an entire branch or entire trunk or, or stem will uh, completely die relatively suddenly, often starting from the base out, so not always. And then model mosaic is the, is the description used to describe uh, viral infections often uh, in, in leaf, so where um, the vir virus particles have infected different plant cells, and then as those plant cells um, uh, rupture from so many viruses inside, they get spread in kind of random patterns. So you see splotchiness um, uh, where the virus has destroyed cells. Um, yes. symptom is uh, the plant's response to the infection. Okay. It's, it, it's the manifestation. Okay. Uh, so what's a good human example? Um, well, by, well, when we get a cold, yeah. um, all the runny nose and all that, those are all symptoms that yeah. you're not actually seeing this, the viruses damaging the tissue. But, so a sign, but a sign would precede a symptom. 
It, it could. Up. It could. Yeah, it could, but not all. Yeah. Uh, some volumes you can see both at the same time. Oh. Yeah, so, so you can see. Not necessarily an ordered thing. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah, okay. not necessarily. Um, like in this case, let's let's look at armillaria root rot. The symptoms of that in, infection would be uh, um, part of the canopy is wilting, uh, the leaves are dropping. Mm -hmm. um, there's no other evidence of damaged tissue on the stem on the outside that would explain any of that. So those are the, that's a symptom. And then when you investigate further, you can actually because this fungus is so aggressive, you can find evidence under the bark. Well, the initial, um, in that case, yes. the initial uh, symptoms that you're seeing, or sorry, the, the initial changes in appearance, you would call a symptom because you can't immediately see the fungus. In order to see it, you have to peel back the bark. Mm -hmm. so, in, so in that case, for, for, for your example, um, you, and you would see the symptom before the sign. So, uh, so it's, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe at the break I can engage a little more about this. I don't want to take time now. Sure, okay. Uh, but the, the, the better the better way to think about it would be a sign is clearly you see the infecting organism. A symptom is what happens to the plant because of that infecting organism. Say that one more time. So the sign is clear evidence of the organism causing the infection. Yeah. A symptom is the plant's response to that infection. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. well, that was good to, to clarify. Uh, biotic diseases, which can cause signs and symptoms, um, uh, are caused by different organisms, so infections by different kinds of organisms. Generally, those are, and most commonly, they are fungi or fungal like organisms. Uh, so there are a group of organisms called oomycetes that, are, that beha behave a lot like fungi, uh, look a lot like fungi, but are not really fungi. That's why I say this here. So, like the, the disease that caused the uh, Irish potato famine, Phytophthora, is an example of that. It's also the common cause of root rots in, in, in other contexts, too. But we group them together because they kind of behave similarly. So uh, these cause most diseases. Um, if, if you had, more likely than not, if someone comes to you, you see symptoms, it looks like a disease. Uh, if you had to bet on it, it's probably a, a fungal uh, a, a organism. After that are bacteria. Uh, bacteria, which we'll look at these more closely, these are much smaller uh, pathogens, um, and they tend to leave and need wetter conditions for infection um, and uh, can also spread extremely easily, <laughs> as, as we know. Viruses, too, cause a fair number of diseases. These are often less severe than bacterial fungal infection. And just due to the um, interesting history of the development of the discipline of plant pathology, uh, often nematodes are considered disease organisms rather than pests, even though they're animals. Um, uh, because plant parasitic nematodes are so small um, and they can impart uh, symptoms that are sort of disease-like. Um, we often talk about nematodes in the context of, of diseases, yeah. Is there a reason why those nematodes aren't considered pests? Uh, it's, it's artificial. It's, literally, it's because when nematodes when it was discovered that nematodes could infect plants, it was that discovery was made by whatever the field existed as plant pathology in the late 19th century. <laughs> and so, and that, that has spread through academia for 150 years. Yeah. But nematologists are technically more, they're studying an animal, a nematode is an animal. Now, uh, another uh, important concept in uh, understanding is a, the disease triangle. Sometimes it's depicted as the disease pyramid. Uh, but the disease triangle uh, is a model uh, that suggests that you need three, if we're, if we're dealing with a triangle scheme rather than a pyramid scheme, three uh, vertices of the triangle in order for disease to occur. So three conditions that need to be present for disease to actually happen. So one, you need a host so a plant, a, a specific species or group of species, that is susceptible to another specific set of pathogenic organisms. Uh, and then the con environmental conditions need to be favorable uh, 
to allow that pathogen to cause the infection in that particular host. If those three conditions are present, then you're likely to get um, disease. Uh, if any one of those three is taken out, you're not likely to get disease. So if you have a tomato fungus, a, a fungus that causes diseases on tomato, and it lands on a cucumber, you do not have the correct susceptible host. So that will not cause infection, not cause disease. If you have that, um, that a spore from a disease that, uh, a spore from a fungus that causes disease on tomato, and it lands on the leaf of the tomato, but the tomato is, is very healthy, it's uh, growing in the right conditions, and let's say the leaves are dry or, or whatever, um, then the environmental conditions are not favorable and this disease will not happen. So in a lot of management situations, one thing you can try to do in an integrated pest management sense is try to target one or all three of these uh, parameters to try to reduce the incidence of disease. So, for example, if you know you have a, a you have a heirloom tomato that's susceptible to uh, Fusarium wilt, which is a, a stem infection, um, and you know that in the, when you've grown that heirloom tomato in your soil in the past, it's consistently got uh, uh, been infected by Fusarium wilt. You know that the pathogen is present, but a way around that is to instead plant a resistant variety of tomato. So that host is no longer susceptible, so disease no longer occurs. In other situations, there it may be hard to control the presence of the pathogen, and you may really want to plant a specific plant that is susceptible, so you try to manage the plant in such a way to reduce the conditions that favor disease. So uh, may, for example, don't water the leaves uh, consistently, water the soil instead. Um, the longer there is water on the surface of plant tissues, um, increases the probability that a disease might cause a successful infection. Um, we've uh, talked, we've alluded to this before, but biotic diseases tend to be restricted to certain hosts, so they have host specificity. So um, more often than not, a tomato disease will not infect a cucumber or your oak tree, but it may infect related species to tomato. So what are some species that are related to tomato that we grow in our garden? Eggplant. Yeah, eggplant, uh, tomato, um, uh, what am I forgetting? Pepper. Peppers, yeah. All those are all, so those are all in the same plant family. And uh, those pathogens evolved ways to overcome some of the defense mechanisms in that group of uh, plants. And so they, it is possible they can infect uh, closely related species. The potato is also in that family too. Um, they tend to appear slowly and get worse. They tend to be a transition zone. This is um, uh, Xanthomonas bean blight. So it's a bacterial disease of, of beans and peas. Um, and you can see that is where the infection began. It's been spreading through the tissue. Um, they can, the, the, the disease propagules can potentially survive season to season. So in some cases, like with southern, um, southern uh, blight, or, or, um, um, yeah, southern blight, uh, this uh, fungus produces these very hard, um, asexual, but very hard capsules that can survive all sorts of uh, environmental conditions. So if you get these in the soil, it can be hard to uh, kill them. It can be hard to plant things in that soil from year to year. Uh, so it's important to take all the tissue out if you can. Yeah. On the previous slide, when you showed that nice um, zone of, you know, how it looks kind of like this, bigger, uh -huh. you showed where the spore landed. I know bacteria can have spore too, but does the presence of that nice black box kind of indicate anything to you? No, it, it, may not, it may not always be present. Okay. Yeah, and, and so uh, a transition zone can be extremely subtle. The halo might not quite be there. It varies a lot from pathogen to pathogen and from uh, host to host, plant to plant. Thank you. So it can get really, really messy there. So, so that's where one strategy, as we'll see, is to first make sure you know what the organism is you're working with, the plant uh, or crop you're working with is. Look up diseases of tomato and start there, and then you can read through the different uh, descriptions of those diseases and see if they start to, to match the problem. That's a good question. Yeah, no, no symptoms can vary a lot. This, the, the, this example of the transition zone and the one I showed before 
are just textbook perfect. So I want them to not that pretty. <laughs> um, oh, I, I'm sorry, I, had, I shouldn't have put this. Is, um, yeah, okay, so quickly though, the, these are the three main causes of uh, biotic pathogens, uh, fungi, bacteria, and viruses. Um, I'm going, I have some of this material in more detail in this slide, so I'm going to summarize it here for the sake of time. But um, long story short, here are um, at most of uh, at the body of a fungus are these strands of cells, these mats of strands of cells. And they're growing into something, into other organisms or into the soil. And the tips of those strands, they're secreting digestive enzymes and consuming and decomposing things. And then under certain conditions, they, these strands will grow in such a way to produce uh, reproductive structures that will be spores that uh, then germinate into new hyphal strands or mycelial strands. Uh, as we'll see in a second, bacteria require an opening or wound to enter a plant, but fungi have to found a way around that. They, they have ways of actually putting a lot of um, a pressure at the tips of their uh, hyphae to penetrate, just break through plant tissue. So they can cause infection without an opening, but they will also take advantage of an opening too, potentially. Uh, bacteria, which are much, much smaller than um, fungi, much, much smaller than plants and animal cells, or some magnitude smaller and um, simpler, they do require um, openings, they're single celled. Uh, they will enter either through wounds, so some other damage, mechanical damage done, and that can be very subtle. That can be uh, they're, you know, planting a, a, a young seedling can, in, in the soil, transplanting or something can cause slight breakages in the stem or in the roots, and that can be a, a potential uh, opportunity for infection. Uh, in other cases, they can enter through the stomata. So the, these are these are the the openings on on leaves where carbon dioxide goes in and water evaporates out. Here are the guard cells that open and close to regulate transpiration, but whenever they're open, that's a potential route for uh, bacteria to enter. Another example would be fire blight, uh, which often enters, is a bacterial disease that often enters in the nectaries of flowers. So it can be spread by uh, pollinators, even they'll have a little bit of bacteria on their legs or something, they're up, all up in the flower's business trying to get that nectar and that lovely pollen, and uh, they end up transmitting the bacterial cells into the nectary opening And then viruses uh, require a vector, so an insect more often than not. Um, so the vir vir viruses are just uh, packets of DNA or RNAs surrounded by protein. They're not alive themselves, but they transmit genetic information and they take advantage of host cellular machinery to reproduce. But in order to get from place to place, they often need some sort of vector. In the case of plants, it can be insects that are feeding on the plants that happen to have the virus in their um, saliva or some other secretion, um, and that is the, the main cause. So often controlling virus, viral infections, in addition to trying to plant resistant varieties, is to try to manage the potential vectors of the virus. So I'll let you read these on your own. I summarize this quickly. Um, I have just some more information um, on each of those Oh, here, I'll stop here for a second on, on viral symptoms. Um, while I would say that model the mo mosaic leaves are the classic sign of a viral infection, um, in other cases they can cause spots that look sort of fungal-like, in other cases they can cause pretty dramatic growth distortions, etc. And there are also um, uh, other organisms like phytoplasmas, which are sort of present bacteria, or just a nucleus, or, or fungi, but just a nucleus, that can cause viral-like symptoms too, but um, rarely, I don't think um, in my history of overseeing master gardeners, we've received more than, and, and so to spend, what, uh, how long have I been here? Uh, seven years. I think we've maybe seen four or five questions about viruses. So the mo most likely, if you know, if you, if you have a disease that you need to identify, it's more likely to be a fungal Okay, so that is a half semester of plant pathology just to condense down into uh, 40 minutes. Um, I, now, uh, quickly, I want to go through some of the
steps to the diagnostic process or the different uh, uh, approaches to try diagnosing um, plant problems. The one I'll start with is the one that's mentioned in the Extension Gardener Handbook. That starts again with correctly identifying the, the plant that's had to have the problems. Uh, don't necessarily trust the, the client. They may not know what they're talking about. Um, sometimes I have to do the mantra to myself, meet people where they are. Meet people where they are. It's like, I promise that is not an oak tree. Um, so different, again, different, uh, different pathogens uh, can infect different uh, plant species. So um, they are host specific. So knowing the, uh, what the plant you're dealing with will greatly narrow down the potential cause of problems if you know it is a biotic disease. And I should add too, uh, disease susceptibility can even vary among cultivars. That's part of the reason we breed cultivars, but breed cultivated varieties is for those uh, disease resistant <laughs> properties, uh, especially in the context of vegetable crops. So um, this is a, a tomato cultivar that is susceptible to fusarium wilt. This is a tomato cultivar that is resistant to fusarium wilt, for example. Uh, then again, remember what's normal. So be able to, to, to uh, know what the context uh, is before you, you assume that what you're seeing is a symptom, not just normal, uh, the normal aesthetic uh, appearance of the, of, the, uh, of the plant. Look at the distribution patterns, not, of just, uh, not just in the landscape, but in, on the organism. So are you seeing um, the, uh, the, the symptoms just on a single plant and uh, the rest of the specimens of that same species? Say, say it's a, a row of uh, arborvitae a hedge of arborvitae, are you seeing consistently the symptoms on the entire row or just on a single plant that will, that will profoundly affect the uh, diagnostic process? So uh, to that point, um, arborvitae and uh, related species um, often do a lot of shedding of uh, leaves in the fall, even though they're evergreen, there could be, and they, wish they can shed any time of the year, but tends to be a higher rate of shedding of older uh, leaves further down the stem in the fall and winter, or uh, fall to early winter. Uh, so uh, it's a very frequent uh, call or question from a client to say, Are my, all my arborvitaes are dying, they're turning brown. When in fact, it's just the interior most <laughs> leaves that are turning brown because the plants said to itself, you're not doing enough work here, you're not intercepting enough light, you're being shaded, I have no need for you anymore, so I shall shed you, be gone. And so you, you'll see a relatively uniform distribution of browning leaves towards the interior of the plant, so towards the base of the stem, and it will appear on all of the arborvitaes in the, in the landscape. So, so look at both the distribution on, in the landscape and then on the plant. On the plant, is it happening uh, on what organism is it happening on? It's happening on the roots, the stems, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit. Is it <coughs> happening on the tips of stems or starting at the base of stems? Is it, um, is it spreading from one location to another? Is it, is it concentrated on one side of the plant or is it uniformly distributed on that individual plant? Oh, sorry, I got it, Michael. There, um, examine all parts, uh, look at is, uh, yeah, in some cases, of uh, the patterns to veins. There are some uh, symptoms that are said to be uh, intervenal, um, so they're between veins. Others are marginal on the leaf, so on the edge of the leaf. And observe any progression. Is it happening in older growth or newer, newer leaves? How is it, is it uniform? It, does it have a distinct bullseye pattern? So there are some, for example, tomato diseases that you may or may not see in about 30 minutes. Um, that have a very distinctive bullseye pattern where there's a brown spot and then there are subtle rings of black, that uh, concentric rings of black within the spot that can be uh, diagnostic. And when you're looking at diseases, uh, looking or researching diseases, uh, those diseases tend to have organ specific names. So uh, a leaf spot or uh, a uh, stem rot, a root rot. 
then consider uh, step five, consider the four causal factors. We've been over these already. Are they figure out is it a potentially abiotic problem or a biotic problem? Is it caused by cultural conditions in the environment or is it caused by another organism? Um, and then determine is it caused by a pest or a pathogen? Is it caused by a, an insect feeding on or nesting in or otherwise um, affecting the host plant or is it caused by a fungus, bacteria, virus, or nematode? Just to review quickly on the signs, symptoms, and tests, if you don't want to forget those. Again, sign is evidence of the presence or absence of the, of the pest in this case or the pathogen in other cases. And a symptom is some growth, there we go, it's a medication, growth or physiological effect caused by that pest or by that pathogen. So um, a sign of pests, or signs of pests can be things like um, there's frass, there's webbing, frass is uh, uh, poop essentially. And from caterpillars are well known for this, they are just kind of walking digestive tract. Um, and, uh, or is there slime trails from the, the, the insect moving around, snail for example, you see past skins from uh, molting. Um, all of those would be considered signs, but a symptom from insect uh, feeding or, uh, or, or egg laying can be, say, uh, as a result of the insect feeding, it's causing growth distortion. So say it's uh, thrips, uh, it's an insect called thrips, and it's um, uh, feeding on a developing leaf bud, and then when that bud opens up, the resulting leaves can have a distorted appearance. Uh, in other cases, insects can cause things like galls, so they'll lay eggs in tissue, and as the uh, larval stage of that insect is developing, it's making use of uh, the plant tissue to form a tumor-like um, um, structure that feeds that, that uh, insect. And again, insects can damage through feeding, uh, they can feed on all parts of the plants, from leaves to inside the stem, outside the stem, and roots on fruits, etc. They can feed by chewing, or they can feed by uh, piercing, sucking mouth parts that end up uh, damaging the underlying tissue. Um, they can uh, can cause some aesthetic problems related to building nests, but often these are not really problematic. It's not going to threaten the plant itself; it just bothers uh, anal retentive people. And then they can also uh, spread disease, as we mentioned, with fire blight. So in this, here's, here's an example of a perfectly helpful pollinator who happens to be spreading the fire blight bacteria. So the bacteria will enter the nectary, spread through the stem below, and eventually the symptom that manifests is blackening and wilting of the ends of the stems, of pears primarily. <coughs> okay, other approaches, just for your reference, uh, Virginia Tech has a different approach that you can certainly um, look at. Uh, in this approach, they try to rule out um, abiotic factors first, which is a sound uh, method too. So find out from the client how long has the plant been there, when they start seeing symptoms, has there been any, any cultural changes near the plant recently, uh, what were the recent weather conditions, and then after you rule those things out, uh, then look, start looking for signs and symptoms of pests or pathogens. And the uh, University of Florida has, um, well, first of all, it has this great four-part series that I uh, sent to Ashley, as she can share with you, uh, four different publications um, about each parts of this diagnostic process. But in this, in this scheme, you rule out insects first. Um, it is Florida, you know. Uh, 25 million insects uh, are resident. No, I'm sorry. Um, um, I don't know what you call it. So rule out insect problems first, and then uh, look at abiotic factors after that. And then, then after you rule those out, start looking for dis um, symptoms and signs of diseases. So the all our valid approaches um, choose the path that, that, that you would. Now, um, general advice when working with clients, because part of the activity today will be some of you will uh, serve the role as clients, so you can go full, you know, Karen if you want to, to for Massacre Garden of volunteers. But you, but you can switch off roles, and part of the, the role play is going to be, can you extract the information you need to extract from the client to help answer the question? Because often, the client doesn't know, they're not master gardeners, they're not plant pathologists, they don't know what to tell you. It's like when, when any of us go to the doctor, where do we start? 
um, uh, childhood. Uh, uh, <laughs> childhood trauma, always the answer. Uh, so uh, you know, beware of leading questions in general. So if they ask you, this is not a, a disease question, but they ask you how much lime should I put in my garden, you never tell them anything. Yeah, you say soil test. That's the answer. Um, and then also just take what they say with a grain of salt. One, um, you know, some of their descriptions, you don't have a photograph, which I always encourage the, you, the client to send images or bring in samples. You know, what is blue versus purple? I have this argument with my significant other all the time. Um, <laughs> what's large and small? You know, when did it start? Um, and then memories are not always accurate. And, and they also don't have, unlike you will have to after today, they don't have the vocabulary to, to describe some of these things. So it's important to be able to try to harvest that information out of them um, by it. Um, and also understand vague questions only get vague answers. Okay? So if, they, if they're asking something, don't, don't try to, um, if they ask you a vague question, you don't have to respond in an email that's um, 20 pages long mm -hmm. about all the possibilities. No, no, put the work on them to say, I can help you further if you tell me blah, 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 blah. Okay? That would save everyone time and give you and give them a more accurate answer. Uh, so what, what plant it are, what, what plant, what conditions, um, when is it growing, what do you want to plant, when do you want, to, et cetera, and then when did, when did the symptoms first start to appear? And the answer they're always going to tell you is, oh, just suddenly. And that's mm -hmm. rarely ever the case. That's when they noticed it. Yeah. So sometimes they don't, you know, we don't walk by, we don't do a, 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 a thorough inspection of all the plants in our landscapes every day. So this can be this can be challenging in some cases, but even getting it down to season can sometimes be helpful with perennial species. Uh, so agents, just things that are not reasonable asks of clients, no, we can't come to your yard. Um, uh, yeah, actually, I'd be happy to go to 280,000 households um, a year, right? Personal, personal landscape advisor, no. Yeah. Uh, and can you recommend specific landscapers or any businesses? No, you provide a list. Um, uh, and then can you <laughs> tell me what kind of plant I have? I, I, I do get, not uncommonly, I have this green plant with leaves on it, and <laughs> the leaves are oval shaped, what is it? Or, right, I, you know, uh, I have this is bug on my plant, it's got six legs, you know, that's not, yeah, and, and images are extremely Part of that too is to avoid the appearance of bias from extension. We don't want to, since we're a government agency, we don't want to say, yeah, I endorse that business because they donated to us, you know, things like that. So that's mainly, that's where a lot of that comes from is we don't want to uh, bias particular businesses. But if there's a, a, a list of businesses, that's fine. You're not biasing any of them. Yeah. So uh, is there a list of things to look for? Sure, you can ask them what they're, if they understand, I don't know, integrated pest management, what do they follow soil test recommendations? Do they know the proper time to apply fertilizer on tall fescue? Um, can, you know, <coughs> if, 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 if they, if you offer th to give them our Carolina Lawns Manual and our uh, lawn maintenance calendar, how do they respond to that? <laughs> Are they dismissive? I don't know, what else thing, other things do you think um, can be asked? I mean, yeah, you, you can, it's more, it's more providing them the information we can provide and uh, having, encouraging the client to ask questions that are, are helpful in that sense. And we do have, uh, we do have guides for arborists specifically. Oh, and nice. Barb Fair, our, one of our local specialists, well, oh, yeah, yeah. one of the state specialists has put out guides for how to identify um, a good arborist, and I can send that around because that can be really kind of for people and it's just some of those basic questions and what are the certifications you'd be looking for but the point really is important to say we typically give recommendations if it's something very very specific and hard to find mm. right and then 
we would even try to give two or three sources. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for example, uh, Debbie Roos in Chatham County will give a recommendation of nurseries for local native plants because they're hard to find and she gives a list. But for something like I want to buy a tree, I would recommend that you go to a local nursery. <laughs> and, and, then, and then in some cases like, like uh, there's, there are databases of inventories too for nursery suppliers like uh, uh, the Johnson County Nursery Association has a database. The North Carolina Nursery and Landscape Association, NCNLA, has a database. So if they need to find where that species you're recommending is located, you can send them a link to that database and they can look it up themselves in that sense. Because it's not your job to call every nursery in Durham County and find out they have that stuff. But that sometimes is the request. Be a personal shopper too. <laughs> um, then, with any of these, any of the, any of the, any sort of diagnostic question, um, find out you know wh where is this occurring? Is this on a vegetable garden? Is it on the edge of the woods? Is it on the roadside? What are the environmental conditions? Is it a species that's growing in a really shady environment, and they're wondering why it doesn't grow well? Well, is it a sun-loving species, for example? Is it, uh, I, this has happened recently, and um, I'm going, uh, well, long story, but uh, someone had um, planted uh, three years in a row, every year, they planted arborvitaes along the fence, and they kept dying. And he's like, what can I spray to fix it? And I said, wow, it's done. Uh, are you planting it? You know, one year, he planted it incorrectly. The year two and three, uh, I said, well, what's the drainage like? Oh. You know, when I dig the hole, water just spills in and it stays there for days. <laughs> ah. yeah. So, find things like that out. Then, Im images are extremely helpful for any diagnostic, okay? So, um, this is an actual image I was sent, I swear to God. Um, this was 2017, Harmon Days, yeah. Um, yeah, so they need to be, you know, ideally, in focus, clear, multiple examples. There, there should be some uh, some idea of scale. So some some like a, a coin or a pencil or something in the image can help with scale. Um, give uh, they need images. You, you want to see what the dish, the pattern on the entire plant. And close up images, uh, in, uh, mid range close up images to show the symptoms of the of the disease and how it's distributed on that organ, etc. And um, there, oh, there's a whole diagnostics chapter in the handbook. I recommend reading that um, after today, too, just to, to re refresh some of these. And there is even a section of that chapter that talks about, uh, in more detail, um, what you, sh you should have in a good image. And now with these prosthetic brains we have that are destroying us, um, there's l less excuse to not be able to take really good photos. Um, um, so, uh, but uh, it's live sample work maybe not so live anymore, but uh, uh, physical samples are also very helpful. So if it's convenient for them to drop off a sample or you find you're not getting anywhere with the images, then physical samples are also great to look at because at that point you can um, look at the structures under magnification and really pinpoint potential problems. Oops, wrong button. Okay, and uh, then there's a link to, um, in the electronic copy, you may have watched this already, but there's a good video that they sent you put out for um, you know, agents, we still die inside every time the phone rings. Um, so here we go. Um, so that's okay. That's, that's a perfectly valid feeling. Um, but it, it is okay. Um, now, uh, before we wrap up, before break, well, I'll, I'll finish research methods. I'll explain the activity. We'll go on a break. We'll come back and do the activity. So, uh, again, the whole, the whole point of our mission here is we're an arm of the land grant universities in the state, so that's <coughs> NC State and NC a &T State. So what our, our, our speciality and our whole brand image is based on conveying, translating, uh, research-based information to the public. And so um, we've got, um, in theory, subject matter experts, peer-reviewed uh, data and studies using the scientific method, and all those are subject to change based on new evidence, et cetera. And that gets filtered down, in theory, to, to agents and volunteers that we can then 
disseminate to the public. Um, and um, ideally, this, a lot of the information you want to convey to the public will come from extension agencies from across the country, ideally something regional. And that's because in, we have certain kinds of problems. Uh, so uh, um, geography uh, affects climatic patterns and, and other uh, ecological factors that will uh, affect uh, the types of plants that grow in a region, the types of uh, diseases and pests that occur in that region. But in other cases, there are some issues that are uh, occur everywhere. Um, so you can, you can, in some cases, with with some uh, uh, confirmation, of course, look at uh, uh, information from other states um, across the country. So every state has a land grant university, uh, or, or at least one, um, and all of those have um, probably a component that is uh, related to horticulture and home gardening. So uh, uh, ideally, we want informa information from NC State or a nearby uh, land grant university or some other land grant university that's accurate information for our area. But there are other sources of uh, research-based information. This can be um, other universities might have might not be technically land grant, but they can still have information that is relevant. Um, reputable botanical gardens. Uh, I guess I should put Duke up there too. Huh? <laughs> well, that, that's bad news. So, so Duke, uh, J.C. Ralston <laughs> Botanical Garden, uh, Missouri Botanical Garden is um, fabulous. If you haven't been, if you need to go to St. Louis, go go there. It's in the middle of the Italian district too, so great food. But uh, they have a lot of good information too um, on a number of things. Walmart Gardens has great information, and then other like consortia um, of say. Uh, the pollinator partnership is going to have a lot of great information about pollinator protection because it's a consortium of um, uh, different universities and government agencies, etc. Uh, and then um, in any peer reviewed journal, if you have access to it, other affiliates with universities, scientific societies like the American Phytopathological Society has lots of uh, good information. It's mostly geared toward pathologists, but sometimes you'll find good images and and information about specific diseases there. Uh, weed societies uh, for invasive species in North Carolina Invasive Plant Council has got great descriptions of invasive species and, and control measures. Um, but other government agencies, federal and state, so NCDA will have great information obviously on soils, et cetera. Things that don't count, um, you know, you know, <laughs> garden or I love woo, but not in this case. Um, home refuge anecdotes, uh, anecdotes uh, popular gardening magazines may or may not be reputable, depending on the author and, and the context. Um, and then, I still don't quite know how this works, but there is a non-existent newspaper. I lived two hours in San Francisco for a few years, and there was no such newspaper in San Francisco Gate that I was aware of, but apparently, somehow this domain name has um, copied and pasted, essentially, um, extension information, and it shows up often in generalized mm -hmm. Google searches. So, so be careful if, if you're just doing a general Google search and you come across some of these websites. Um, don't trust and then verify <laughs> um, uh, with other extension information. Uh, and this was among the first images of witchcraft that came up on Google search. <laughs> uh, that's good to know. OK, now some top methods for finding this research-based information. Um, one, met, one, one path is through extension.org forward slash search. They changed the URL in the past two years. But the Extension Foundation is not what it used to be, but it's still around. This is a, uh, but one, one remnant of it is this website that cross searches extension agencies across the country. So it's a, it is just a modified Google search. So you can put in this uh, query bar, tomato diseases, and it'll come up with a list of tomato disease publications from universities, extension universities across the country. Uh, sometimes it, there's, a, there's an art form in looking through the search results uh, in terms of the, you know, opening up each link and inspecting the publication to see if it's helpful or not. Because um, the best publication might not be at the top, that's just the one that's used the most. Um, you can, if you want to, um, add things, uh, add components to the query to make it more specific. So you can add NCSU, Clemson, um, and Virginia Tech, Virginia, 
things like that that can that will narrow down to something more regional. Uh, but a few and a, 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 a caveats here. Uh, for some reason, a lot of the Clemson publications don't show up in the search results uh, from, from this method. Uh, and Clemson has a lot of excellent publications. Um, a perhaps melodramatic retelling of the story, what else do I do? But uh, like post-2008, they essentially cut a lot of staff and put a lot of money into revising their publications. And so, you know, a lot of people lost their job, but they got good publications. <coughs> so, uh, and, but they've rebuilt since then. <coughs> the uh, Clemson agents I've met have been extremely impressive. But uh, so Clemson, some of the reason it doesn't appear here, sometimes I just uh, said search, do a Google search and add Clemson or Clemson, uh, sorry, Clemson HGIC, which is the Home Garden Information Center. <coughs> Um, uh, yeah, so when, when you add, you know, it might not be it might be helpful to start general and then be more specific to see what's out there, and that's when you can add the uh, the, the state uh, indicators to, to the search. You can also just do a Google search. They own everything and everyone, so why not? Um, but when you do, uh, there are um, other search terms you can add to the query search results. So comma ext will search more or less extension sites. Um, adding dot edu will also give you better results. Or just searching extension, they're adding some descriptor of, um, of the uh, university to that search well too. I mentioned uh, Clemson, because that's the land grant university in South Carolina. Um, they've got a lot of good publications. UMD is University of Maryland. Um, and so NCSU and UMD I use instead of North Carolina or instead of NC State because that is what appears in the uh, URL. So it would be like umd.edu or ncsu.edu, for example. Uh, the handbook does have a um, appendix that can sometimes be helpful in a general sense. But appendix C has some diagnostic tables from more common issues that might help narrow some things down potentially. And then um, at the horticultural, uh, horticulture portal from NC State, so horticulture.ces and ncsu.edu, there is a feature called a um, info search, and there's one for vegetables, fruits, and ornamentals. And in that bar, um, it will search not only NC State and old NC State publications, supposedly it will also cross-reference certain trade publications, but you're often have articles written by extension personnel. Uh, it will also sort of search some of the some research journals that are related to really applied plant sciences. So that's another technique. Um, and then it, it, when you put, well, after you put in the search term, you can click any of these tabs to to sort uh, the search results if you want. Uh, okay, so that is the that's my spiel. Um, we have ten ten. A little early for break. What do you think, Ashley? Want to do the breakdown? Break early and then come back. Yeah. Okay. What time is it?